I absolutely think it's, po it's possible uh, to experience love through the economic system and the financial system. Uh, that, that in a way is the entire reason why we exist here at RSF Social Finance. Um, when we say that our, our purpose or our, our objective is to transform the way the world works with money, it is for that reason. Um, and so we feel like if financial transactions can become more direct, transparent, and personal, uh, then a, it will be possible for a world, for an economy uh, based on love and mutual respect to emerge. What you see mostly in private banks across the world is that we have layers of wealth. If you are very wealthy, yeah, for instance, you have a more than a million, one million dollars or something, you prefer to bank with bank A. And if you're extremely wealthy, for instance, 10 million, you get, uh, you're probably, you would probably consider a banking with a f Swiss uh, institution. And if you have a hundred million plus or something, very, very wealthy, you have an inner other institution. Those m layers are not mixed mostly. But what we have had three years month with our different way of banking is that people who have a, only 1,000 euros to invest or to save do equally feel at home as somebody who has 10 million to invest. They like to meet each other. We have client meetings. They have, have share the same values. They are the, 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 like the, the, the social entrepreneurial, they're the culture creative ones. And when you share the same values, you don't care anymore how much money you have to invest. It's the, in, the meeting of minds instead of, of monies. And that's a very, I would say, very inspirational for us at least. Well, one of the most powerful things that we do here at RSF, uh, we feel like today's financial system and, and the culture of money, uh, we describe it as being complex, opaque, and anonymous based on short-term outcomes. And where we hope to get to is a world where financial transactions are direct, transparent, and personal based on long-term relationships. And so what we do to that end is we, we have uh, about 1,700 investors in our loan fund, and then we have about 100 borrowers, uh, social enterprises that borrow money from us. And each quarter, we bring together representatives of our investors and our borrowers to meet each other uh, and to learn each other's stories, to know something of each other's needs and intentions. And then it is actually that group that advises us on what rate of return the investors should get and what interest rate the borrowers should pay. And so it's a, it's a community-based form of setting the price of our loans in such a way that it is off the grid of the Wall Street financial system and we're not dependent on uh, the London interbank offering rate or any other Wall Street benchmark in order to do what we do. Die GLS Bank ist die erste sozialökologische Universalbank der Welt. Sie ist äh, 1961 letztlich schon gegründet worden durch eine stiftungsähnliche Einrichtung. Aus ihr ist dann 1974 bereits die Bank entstanden. Die GLS Bank ist ja eine Genossenschaftsbank. Das heißt, sie gehört den 20.000 Mitgliedern, die wir haben. Sie ist unverkäuflich. Man kann uns nicht kaufen, man kann uns nicht, mit uns nicht spekulieren. Wir sind im Volks- und Raiffeisenbankverbund drin. Ähm, das ist ein klares, einfaches Bankgeschäft. Und äh, ohne Spekulation und ähm, das ist ein Vorzeigemodell inzwischen. So a moment for me that was very important in my life related to my perception of uh, our economic system and our financial system. When I first really became aware of it was my first job. I, I was a caddy. I carried golf bags for uh, Wall Street traders and bankers in New Jersey. And I got to hear the conversations that they were having. And I would ask them, what did you do? Uh, what, what do you do day to day? And they had a lot of difficulty explaining to me wh what they did. And that didn't seem to make a lot of sense because I said to myself, here are people that have a lot of the wealth and power in society, and yet it's very hard to understand exactly what they do. And so that has led, I was age 14 at the time, and that has led me into a lifetime of inquiry in trying to understand how does the financial system work? Who is it for? Uh, what do people actually do who are in finance? Um, and it's, it's been a fascinating journey. But I, I also, from that moment, have been questioning uh, basically all of the assumptions of 
uh, why our financial system exists as it does. Trials Banks tries to, to focus on, on where the impact is and we can reach as many uh, mm. clients as possible and for that reason we sort of want to be part of the, of the system in a way. Only if you are in the system, if you are in society, you can make that change. Um, and a bank, um, we deliberately want to be a commercial organization and uh, with objective and with a profit objective as well. Profit for a Triodos Bank is not the only objective, it's the end result. If we do well and we are a healthy company and we're doing our work properly, then there should be a normal profit so we can invest again and we can continue innovating. That's how a company works. We have in fact a quite very good relation with other banks. We don't we are not against the banking world. We we, we have collaborations with other banks, we respect ourselves. And uh, I think we learn from each other. And I think when you talk personally to, uh, to bank managers, I think they quite as a person agree with the model that we follow and they, and they respect very much this model. The question is, are they as an individual able to change the system? They are also prisoner of a system. Right? If they, they manage a bank, they have shareholders, and shareholders have a certain behavior, and so they have to take this into account, and the question is, do they have the courage, do they, they, they can afford to take the risk of changing some things in their behavior with the risk that they lose their job if it is not successful on the financial side. So this is a very big di dilemma for bank managers. I personally believe that the era of shareholder capitalism that we've experienced the last, particularly the last 150 years or so, is coming to a close. And that the era of Wall Street domination is essentially over. Um, and we will not see wholesale huge changes in that soon, but the era of stakeholder capitalism is emerging. And uh, the idea of a regenerative economy based on sustainability principles seems to be what a large number of people want, uh, particularly the younger social entrepreneurs that we come into contact with. Uh, they, they see having a company or being in business um, as a way to create social and environmental change. And, and they're literally harnessing the power of business in order to do that. And so we're seeing lots of evidence of that. The idea of the founders eh, to connect money to investors and savers, to, act, to connect sustainable projects and entrepreneurs to uh, uh, savers and investors, it's still valid. It's, it's surprising after 30 years that this model basically is still known by everyone who, is in, who works in this bank. And it's also a very powerful model. Eh? We have survived uh, the financial crisis very well. We have, come, uh, we, have been, we have come out stronger. We have survived uh, crises like the environment in this issue, on this issue, uh, like the Chernobyl, for instance, in the, uh, the end of the 80s. Uh, quite a shock, which really gave the sustainable cause another push in the direction. And we have also uh, survived, uh, and we will survive, um, I would say, uh, different our political systems. Uh, well, as you probably, uh, we are aware that that every century or every every year, the the, the political. Uh, viewpoint of how society should be built or maintained or be improved. It's always shifting a little bit to the left or to the right, but this model seems to be working in every political spectrum. Uh, I've met some of, of, the, of the founders recently and I saw that, that entrepreneurial spirit of these guys. They, that, that's the way they wanted to make it happen from a very clear vision, but very much from a, a um, 
uh, yeah, a bank, a commercial organization and attracting a lot of people and not being a sort of minor player that does, think, does things very well but no one knows about. Uh, we want everyone to know about it and really attract uh, a lot of people. And the cultural creators in that sense is a quite broad group consisting of very different audiences within. 1968 was a period where new ideas came in and uh, there was then a group of people uh, who were bankers, consultants, but most of the people inspired by, uh, by the works of Rudolf Steiner. Um, and they wanted to think about other ways to use money on a more authentic way and try to see if you can really use money as a development tool rather than making money with money. And they started with a, um, a study group for a few years and in the early 70s, 70, 1971 I think, they founded a foundation and they started collecting money uh, for this foundation and started small financing of uh, Waldorf schools or biodynamic farms and, and tried really to experiment what they have been studied like a study group. And it was rather successful and they organized pooling of money with a bank uh, a mainstream bank and this bank gave them then a, a sort of a commission so they could increase their capacity to uh, to lend money and then yeah so they, they, they saw that it was too limited and that the next step would be to create a bank so they started discussion with uh, the central bank and uh, well, there was a very big discussion about the uh, central bank said, well, it's nice, you are a sort of group of special interest, why don't you uh, found a cooperative bank and then you become a bank in favor of your members. And the reply of the group was to say, no, we would like really to create a bank that is really an institution in society and not a bank for anthroposophists. I would really would like to, to, to found a bank that is available for everybody and really has become a change actor in society. It was a long discussion, finally they got an approval. And what is also special that no one of the, um, of the founders stepped in the bank. Mm -hmm. They all remained outside of the bank, they created the bank, they have searched for a managing director and they started. Where does the money come from? And of course modern states have, you know, like a forced giving that's taxes. <laughs> but um, that is a very indirect way of giving and it's not by free choice. We also believe that there's a spiritual component to giving. Uh, when, you, when you give away money and even if it's only five euros, <laughs> but even more so if it's five million, the money is coming from somewhere, you are in touch with that money and where the money comes from. It's, it's inside you in a way. You're connected with it. Three types of money. You have the, the gift money, you have the, um, yeah, how to say in English, buying money, and you have the lending, the money for lending. Eh? And I would say the gift money is also an area where we as organization are active in, but in a foundation. And gift money is very necessary for very early development, things that are not really developed. Uh, for instance, uh, when you care, educate a child, you don't know what the uh, economic outcome will be. So it's just giving and let things develop. Science, research is also gift money. If you um, work with lending money, and in between you have also equity, um, I would say you are in a, 
in a stage where there is a certain outcome that you can, um, you have an outlook about some things that will happen. You, you build a factory to produce some things, so you know there is a plan that the money will come back. So this is an, a, a later stage in the evolution. And then you have, uh, I would say, the money that you use for buying things. And this is something that fully, that there is no surprise. You, you, you get, you buy something and you get some things in exchange. So these three types of money we work with. A lot of people these days, I think, give away money and it's almost like buying something for that money they give, you know. I give you this money but you have to do this with it. And we try to keep it as free as possible. Um, of course, people have their own ideas where their money should go. And we welcome that, of course. But it shouldn't be, you know, people shouldn't be tied down with the money they receive. They should feel free to do what they believe is the right thing with it. A school needs, needs freedom and, you know, if, if we have a donor and he or she says, well, you know, here's the money, but we want you to teach this and that, then that's not really giving. Uh, the, so we, we, we often have very long processes with people who call us up and say, you know, I'm thinking about, um, about giving some money into this field. And sometimes it takes years to, to find the right thing, to find the right form, and we do a lot of counseling in that direction. Investing money is very important because um, that's where you, you, you put some changes in society. So we, we invest, we have three areas. The cultural area where we finance theatres, we finance cultural centres, uh, uh, individual artists, for instance music instruments, we have certain system, we finance museums. Um, that's very important to have this. Uh, we have the social sector and there it's more healthcare, uh, homes for handicapped people, uh, th these type of uh, financings. And then we have environment, uh, which is um, the financing renewable energy, organic agriculture, I would say also the all organic uh, food chain. Um, we finance sustainable buildings, uh, this is, um, and renewable energy, we finance uh, uh, wind energy, solar energy, biomass, uh, uh, these are... The In today's world, I think most people don't think about how a school is being financed. It's all done by the state, or how research is financed, and the idea of giving money has a lot to do with freedom because uh, the profits that are being made, uh, especially in factories, um, when, when factories get taxed, then the state decides what to do with that money. And we don't even have to be concerned about it, you know. But that's not the freedom we talk about. The freedom we talk about is the freedom of, the, of that side that receives the giving money. And I think research is a very good example. Um, for, for example, the um, pharmaceutical companies, they finance their research. It's, it's a bit of giving in, in one company if you, if you look at it from the, from the qualities of money perspective. You know, there's the production and the production uh, has a, um, has profit and the profit goes into research so it's the it's the flow of money there but what what would the research look like is it really you know free research do people look at what is needed in the world or is the research done to find that certain kind of medication that yet again would produce more profit on the other side um, Steiner compares um, in one of his lectures, he, he compared uh, money with other goods and he said, you know, why is it that money just doesn't rot away? And that is a very strange thing because, you know, there's, you have a loaf of bread and either you use that bread or it goes off and then it's gone. But with money, it stays and it stays and it stays and that, that is quite strange and it causes 
quite a lot of problems. Now it's really hard to change that. I mean, there's, there's a few initiatives, maybe in your country too, that have other ideas about, you know, there's alternative currencies and, and they have a use-by date printed on. <laughs> but, you know, for a state economy, that is probably not a feasible concept. But starting to think about it, you know, 90 years after <laughs> Steiner talked about it, um, is a very valid thing. And um, we, think, we think about it in Treuhand, and one thing is that, that comes out of that idea is that we try to keep money in a flow. We, you know, a, lot, a lot of people pile their money up. It's almost like in these old comic, American comic books where you have, <laughs> where you have this duck sitting on this pile of money. <laughs> And then it's really not good for anything anymore. We believe that money needs to be kept in a flow. And that is, that is our policy. I mean, we're not always able to do that because um, there's a lot of fear involved when it comes to money. And the fear is that we don't have enough in the future, especially. So. Um, one of the things that comes out of thinking about money is how shall we deal with future money? And I'm afraid we haven't really found the solution to that yet. <laughs> but um, it's good to, you know, to raise the question all the time. And in our foundations, we, we try to set them up so that the money can be used up within one generation because um, a, the money should be used up and not, you know, kept to eternity. And, and the other thing is that, you know, usually we can't really see into the future. <laughs> so you set up a foundation today and with the problem that are in today's world. But um, in 30 years, that might look um, very different, you know, maybe certain areas maybe you know if you look at a disease and um, some diseases might not be around for much longer <laughs> uh, people you know might might fight a certain kind of disease and we think that's a bit too narrow uh, we think there should be a, a bit of a bigger approach and uh, it should be possible to to use up that money in a certain period of time so that new, because there's always new money, there's always new profit being produced in a way. So we, we need to let go of our fear and believe that there will be more in the future as well and that that money should be used for the tasks in the future. 70% uh, of our assets here at RSF are held by women. So we... Uh, for whatever reason, um, I believe that it's going to be critical for more women to uh, to express themselves strongly about what they feel about the uh, financial world and the, and, and the economy. And in fact, that is happening. It's actually very encouraging. I believe that 97% of the senior jobs on Wall Street are held by men. And I feel like until 50% of them are held by women, we may end up getting the same result that we've been getting. Because men, there's a certain deal adrenaline, uh, there are certain power issues, uh, there's certain short-term issues. Uh, and I feel like women are more in touch with the intuitive side of how we're all interconnected. Uh, and, and a community-based way of thinking. Uh, and I feel like that's going to be tremendously important for us to have some balance, a gender balance in uh, economic actors and financial participants in our society. I absolutely believe uh, in the tipping point uh, uh, way of, of thinking. I, I, I do not put much stock in policy changes or big top-down solutions being the way that that meaningful change in our financial system or economic system is ever going to happen. I absolutely subscribe to the idea that there is a grassroots upswelling right now as we speak. Um, that uh, over time, it, it, it right now is a relatively a relative handful of people, um, but that, that are really questioning the core assumptions of our economic system and are very much intent 
on trying to express themselves differently, whether that's how they invest, uh, where they bank, um, what they buy at the store. They are looking to make sure that their core values are expressed in how they use their money. And I think that that, um, that is going to be growing uh, quite a bit over time, but it will still take it will still take some time, but uh, I absolutely believe that there's a, a, this grassroots upswelling right now and that that's going to make the change. The, the number of culture creators is increasing and so they, they, are, they could be very powerful already. Um, when I, I, we are, with banking, you are in a sector that people feel uh, is important if you tell about it and they all like us, and they all like what we're doing, but they're not switching accounts. And it makes me nuts. <laughs> they, um, and I can understand on one hand, you don't want to be busy on Saturday uh, switching accounts, not knowing where you go to, and uh, you are with your bank, and why changing, and, and what we try to explain that yeah, if you, if you really think banks should change, in a, uh, in a way society should change, you should act individually differently. And that holds true when you go to the supermarket and you buy meat, you can make choices every day again. It's when you go on holiday and you decide what to do, uh, how you, you do that, you make choices every day. It's when you take your car or not. It's on every level and also with banking. And I think for people it's easier to, uh, when they buy clothes, to look for uh, organic cotton or whatever. That's easier uh, than to change banks, I have to admit. Um, the last couple of months, we, well, we grow uh, uh, um, all the time by, by 20, 25% on an annual basis in all countries. And uh, so we do see a lot of people that make the change, on the other hand. And funny enough, if they uh, go for it, if they have decided mentally, I'll, I'll do it, they go all the way. They change all their accounts and they go for it. And what we hope and what we try to do is to make them ambassadors and to tell others as well to do it. Um, so I can be very positive, but I'm also very realistic that everyone talks about what they want to, what they like to happen, but they're not always that active. And I think we could do more. Um, and I'm not blaming anyone. I think it's a very individual responsibility that you have to feel. And um, yeah, it's a development. Some people already have it and also make the choices for banking. And I'm really happy with that. And for some, it has. It, we need more time. And what I can do as a marketeer, uh, really offering them the alternative. And Trudel's Bank, you can do already in five countries. Uh, Uh, you can start act today. Also das Zukunft, die Zukunft des, äh, des Bankensystems ähm, sehe ich, dass wir in vielerlei Hinsicht äh, ganz, starke, ganz stark reformieren müssen. Ähm, es hat ja jetzt schon angefangen, die Diskussion, dass wir Leerverkäufe, dass Leerverkäufe verboten werden, dass, es, äh, dass Hedgefonds verboten werden und so weiter. Also es muss, äh, es muss starke Regulierungen geben. Also nicht alles, was, was man machen kann, sollte man auch machen dürfen. Ähm, und es wird in vielerlei Hinsicht wird es Reform, Reform Arbeiten geben müssen im Banken- und Zahlungssystemen ähm, und ein Vorzeigemodell ist sicherlich die GLS-Bank, wo man sagt, man kann auch anders mit Geld umgehen und wir zeigen, wie das geht. Ich persönlich glaube immer an die Vernunft und das Gute im Menschen. Ja. Ähm, sicher bin ich mir nicht. Sicher bin ich mir nicht. Also man muss sich einfach klar machen, dass nach der Banken- und Finanzkrise, wo man ja wirklich gedacht hat, und feststellen konnte, dass eine unglaubliche Krise entstanden ist. Milliarden von, von Geldern sind verloren gegangen, Menschen sind in die Armut getrieben worden. Das hat ja seinen Ausgangspunkt genommen in den USA mit, den Immobil mit der Immobilienkrise. Also Millionen von Menschen sind betroffen, haben ihre Arbeitsplätze verloren, haben ihr Geld verloren und so weiter. Und letztlich hat sich nichts geändert.
Es wird genauso weitergemacht wie vorher. Im Gegenteil, wir haben sogar äh, Kolleginnen und Kollegen, die von anderen Banken zur GLS-Bank gekommen sind im letzten Jahr, die gesagt haben, dass es bei den Banken, bei den normalen Banken sogar noch schlimmer geworden ist, weil jetzt die Verluste wieder reingeholt werden müssen, die man 2008 erlitten hat. Also von daher ist Ihre Frage schwierig und ich kann sie nicht beantworten. Well, I'm always optimistic, but <laughs> I'm optimistic. I, I really believe in people and I can see that people start thinking about their money. I'm not so optimistic about the state or the system of capitalism itself because it's, it's reproducing itself all the time, but I can see cracks in the system as well. And the cracks give me hope. I think there are not only negative things in the world, I think the world is also moving. I think we have a very much higher degree of consciousness about what are the issues of, uh, of the world. And the question is, can you change? Can you change some things? And I think as an individual, I think the only thing that you can do is to, to live in consistency with your values and start with your selves. If you have money, care for your money where it goes. If you don't have money, do something else. My feeling is that in today's economic system, we've built up so many layers of intermediation. Uh, and it's so difficult to understand where your food comes from and if you have a, a bank account, where does the money go? Uh, th there's so many instances of this where it's so hard to understand uh, wh wh where the source is separated from where the actual application or experience uh, uh, of, of a product lies. And, and so my great hope is that in the financial system at least, if we can shrink that gap, if we can make um, help the participants in a financial transaction be more visible to each other uh, and they then have an experience, a, a chance to have a personal relationship. Uh, that I think is the point at which we can start to see love emerge in the economy um, because if we keep all these layers in between um, it, it will be very, very hard to, uh, to experience that. So I, I am very hopeful because I feel like that is happening uh, gradually but steadily now, but that would be the number one uh, hope that I would have.